Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Jazakallah for being back here again. Uh, those of you who are back with us right now. And inshallah, we will be starting in another couple of minutes. And I want to give everyone time to come in, um, mainly because um, after this session, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that we will be having a quiz. And that's going to happen next uh, Monday. So during our Sira session. We're going to do a quiz on the 14 clans of Quraysh. Now, all the information that you need will be available on this presentation itself and also last uh, lesson's presentation. And all the questions will come from both these presentations. Uh, the prize, we're just going to keep it a secret for now, which will be revealed, inshallah, next week. We're hoping it will be somewhat educational as well. Okay, so um, we're just going to give another minute and then we will be um, starting our session, inshallah. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions about the Kahoot quiz that we're going to have next week, uh, do let me know in the chat. And um, if you have any questions about anything else so far, please do let me know as well. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh juaria. Wa alaikum wa salam. Um, Hussein, well done both of you for being here and also, mashallah, wa alaikum as uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak as well wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, I think we've given enough time um, we will begin our session today so as you are all aware that our previous lesson was part one of the 14 clans of Quraysh and today we're going to be finishing off the um, the remainder of the clans that we couldn't discuss last week. Wa alaikum assalam, Mudathir and uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak. Yes, you can look at your notes for the quiz. Absolutely, you're more than welcome to look at the uh, your notes. However, let me just let you know, uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak, that uh, in a Kahoot quiz, you're only going to have up to like ten seconds to answer each question. So just say if there are about 30 questions, there's only going to be about 10 seconds um, to answer the questions. So you may not have enough time to write uh, to um, look at your notes. But if you write out your own notes and you keep them in front of you, you're more than welcome to look at them as well. OK, so this does kind of hopefully emphasize the importance of writing notes as well. But Jazakallah for asking these questions. It really shows that we do have um, online students who are taking away from this. So Jazakallah for that. So just to mention, I'll mention this again at the end of today's lesson, that inshallah next lesson will be a Kahoot quiz on the 14 clans of Quraysh. So that would include information from today's lesson that we're going to have and also last uh, lesson as well. So it's about the 14 clans. Everything that you need to know will be present in this presentation. So make sure you download them later on from our website and have a go through or you can watch this again if you have the time to do so as well. I hope I've answered the question for you, uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak, inshallah. Okay, so let's move on, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And as we begin the blessed seerah of uh, our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we begin with salutations upon Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, inna ka Hamid Majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, inna ka Hamid Majid. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So um, as we are doing uh, and as we do every week, we, we, we are kind of going through our journey of this textbook revelation, the story of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I do advise you to get this book and also keep it with you. It's a, you know, a fantastically well-structured uh, book on the seerah of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So just a quick summary of where we are in terms of the seerah. Um, we covered the first three years, which are known as the private invitation years of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's 23 years of prophethood. Then comes the fourth year, which is known as the public invitation year, 
where Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam publicly calls out to the people of Mecca. He gives da'wah to the people of Mecca. And then comes year five, which we stopped at, and that was the migration to the kingdom of Aksum or to Abyssinia, where many Sahaba, some say over 80, some say over 100 Sahaba, migrated all the way to Abyssinia. And we went into that in quite a bit of detail. We took a pause in between before we get to year number six to look at and analyze um, the kind of different um, clans under the Quraysh tribe just to get a good context, geographical feel of who was who and which clan they belonged to. So um, we're going to continue our lesson on that. Um, so we did all the way up to uh, Makhzum. We are now going to carry on, inshallah, from there. Just to give you uh, a good indication of where these clans were based in and around Mecca, al mukarrama this map that I'm showing you, this will be part of the quiz. So um, do look at it, you know, do understand where's what. I might even ask some of the main clans. I'm not going to ask the, you know, the smaller clans. I, may, I might say, okay, you know, the, the purple section, number 11, which clan occupied that region? So you should know it's the Banu Makhzum because Banu Makhzum, as I've mentioned, are one of the most powerful, uh, most richest clans. Okay, and they play a massive role in the seerah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and have a massive impact um, on the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and the life of early Islam in general. And also, so Banu Makhzum, we need to know them, right? And then you also have the Bani Abdi Shams, okay? Number four, can you see? They also occupy a large portion geographically of Mecca as well, okay? Uh, alongside those, we have the Banu Hashim. We need to definitely know where the Banu Hashim are situated, um, not only because of their, uh, you know, the, the power that they had in the, in the past, but also because our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born into the Banu Hashim of the Quraysh tribe. So I may ask some of these as well, maybe a couple more. Okay, so do try and somewhat memorize. Um, okay, do somewhat memorize this. Okay, right, moving on. Right, so what I want to do now very quickly, I did this last week as well, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but very quickly, just to um, kind of refresh the kind of cracks that were appearing amongst the Quraysh tribe. So uh, when we say amongst the Quraysh tribe, we're talking about the 14 clans and the sub-clans of the Quraysh. So first of all, as we remember, we spoke about Qusay. Okay, Qusay, he marries um, into the previous tribe of Khuza'a. And as he marries, he there is a power that there is a vacuum in terms of power, and there's a power struggle, and ultimately he wins uh, that power struggle, and he 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 becomes the leader of Mecca, and as a result of that incident, he brings his tribe, so the Quraysh tribe, into Mecca. Now, from the Quraysh tribe, right, he brings. If you can see here, there are. Uh, the Quraysh of the Hollow or Quraysh al Bita. These are the clans that are situated closer to the Kaaba itself. Okay, so the, the closer to the Kaaba itself. And then you have the Quraysh of the outskirts. They were situated on the outskirts, obviously, of um, uh, uh, of Mecca. So Quraysh of Wawahir. So this is kind of the first kind of, um, you can say, uh, distinguishing feature amongst two sets of, um, of, of, of the Quraysh tribe. Then comes uh, the power struggle again. Okay, so Qusay has four sons, uh, Abdul Dar, Abdul Manaf, Abd and Abdul Uzza. When Qusay passes away, right, um, Abd Manaf was seen as the most capable to be the next leader of the uh, Quraysh tribe. However, Abdul Dar was the eldest and he was given the responsibility. Um, so things were fine up until then. When Abd Manaf passes away, his son Hashim uh, is now in a power struggle um, with his uncle Abd Dar, and ultimately, as a result of this, what happens is there are now two factions within the Quraysh tribe. So you have those who are backing and supporting Hashim, and you have those clans who are backing and supporting Abd Dar. Okay, so remember those who support Hashim 
they are known as, known as the scented ones and mutayyabun why are they known as that because they come to the Kaaba, they put their hands into um, uh, into perfume and they wipe it on the Kaaba uh, as a symbolism of their pact okay and those who support abdul dar and his leadership okay what they do they are known as the confederates so they take an oath to support abdul dar and it's very close that war begins and many thousands are killed as a result of this what ultimately happens is there's a you know decision is made that uh, abdul dar will be responsible for the keys to the kaaba and banu hashim will be responsible for the khidma and the upkeep and the you know the caretaking of the pilgrim pilgrims who come for hajj okay so that's this is like the second kind of um crack that appears amongst the clans and then the last and third one is when there is an incident that takes place a trader is robbed of his rights and his goods and he's not paid back he climbs up uh, uh marwa and he sorry he climbs up safa mount safa and he proclaims and he asks and beseeches for help and there's no one there to respond except for um uh, uh, you know uh, uh, some uh, you know some of the some of the clans from the Quraysh tribe so for example so uh, it was from the the, the Saham clan who oppressed this trader from Yemen uh, Makhzum supported Saham okay Abd shams also supported Saham and as as you've noticed Makhzum and Abd shams are the most powerful clans in the Quraysh tribe and not only that they are amongst the richest they are the richest of the um Quraysh tribes as well so they wanted the status quo therefore they did not want to help that um uh, trader and ultimately what happens is when Hilf, Hilf al fudul takes place the pact of chivalry that if someone is wronged we will support them and we will back them regardless of any or of them having any allies amongst the clans okay and what happens however on the upside is Banu Taim, Hashim, Zuhra, Muttalib and Adi right these are the clans that uh, you know that take up this pact of chivalry uh, to respond to any kind of oppression that takes place regardless of um, any allies uh, or regardless of someone having any support amongst the clans so here's another kind of rift that takes place so these are the, so this is just to give you an idea of the complexity of the clan structure in mecca at the time of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay now moving on so now we move on after Makhzum. last week we finished on Makhzum. we're going to go through each clan at a time and just to mention that next week's uh, quiz and the questions you're going to have are all going to be from these two presentations. So if you want to revise, have a look at these. I'm not expecting you to memorize everything, but just expecting you to maybe have a bit of idea about each clan. Maybe remembering one key person who either accepts Islam from each clan or one key enemy of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who opposes Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam vehemently or opposes Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam physically and verbally in every way possible. So, Banu Saham. Although the Saham clan is one of the more, the more powerful clans in Mecca, it contains few notable allies and enemies other than Amr ibn al-As who later becomes an, who tried to bring the Muslim immigrants back from Abyssinia and we spoke about this uh, I remember a few weeks ago and the Prophet Wasallam's companion Khunais ibn Hudhafa who belongs to a less important branch of Saham so when you remember Saham when you think about Saham think about Amr ibn As anhu. he is the very person who was sent to the kingdom of Aksum to speak to Ashama or Najashi as he is known and he as he comes up and dis, and as he is described in the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so it was Amr ibn As radiyallahu anhu uh, who tried to argue the case for um, you know the, the the elite class of the Quraysh to bring back the Sahaba to Mecca however he failed in his attempt oops okay so um Khunais ibn Hudhafa, he immigrates to Abyssinia and returns soon after to mar marry Hafsa bint Umar. When he dies one year after Badr, 
Hafsa radiallahu anha marries the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and becomes his fourth wife. Now, any person that we mention with this kind of blue background, you know, the Islamic art background, there might be a question about them in the quiz. So I would definitely recommend that um, you know you, you you kind of maybe have a look at some of them as well. So I won't ask about all of them, maybe a few. So it is a quiz, okay? So Khunais ibn Hudhafa. Now, um, to show you geographically where Banu Saham are situated, so if you look at number five, can you see all the way? And if you look at the color coding, they are Banu Saham are the Quraysh of the outskirts, yeah? So Quraysh of Zawahir. Um, okay, let's move on. So then we move on to Banu Amir. Okay, Banu Amir, they are Quraysh of outskirts as well, okay? But they're you know, their, their economic situation and their political interests are more in line with Quraysh of the Hollow, okay? Quraysh that are closer to the Kaaba itself. Now, one of the most notable figures from Banu Amir are Suhail ibn Amr al-Amiri. Now, what is he notable for? He was one of the most violent enemies of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa now, what makes him an interesting figure to remember is many, many of his family members, however, accept Islam. So, you know, they, you know, regardless of his violence towards Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, regardless of that and, you know, not being afraid of that kind of violence, many of his family members accept Islam. And as you can see on the um, diagram next to it, you can see Suhail, right? He's the chief of Amr. Uh, at the current state, chief of Amr. So from um, from 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 his uh, family there, Abdullah becomes Muslim. Abu Jandal, Sahla, right, who's the wife of Abu Hudayfa, uh, Um Kulthum, who's the wife of Abu Sabra, and amongst his uh, siblings, you have Hatib, Salit, Sakran, uh, who's the husband of Soda, who we will talk about in a bit as well. Okay, and if you can see from his siblings, interestingly, uh, uh, you know, all three of them, they migrated to Abyssinia. And also from his children, Sahla and Umm Kulthum, they too migrated to Abyssinia. Okay, right. Uh, Wa alaikum salam, Zahra. Um, Yasta, the picture is blurred. Um, oh, Jazakallah for sorting that out, uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak. Jazakallah for that. So I'm glad that's sorted. So this is Banu Amr. So when we mention Banu Amr, think of Suhail ibn Amr al Amiri as kind of the chief of the clan of Banu Amr at this stage in the life of Mecca. Um, violent enemy towards Prophet. Sallallahu however, However, and I think what increases his violence and his distaste and hatred towards Prophet ﷺ is the mere fact that many of his family members have accepted Islam. Okay, this is this is key in the case of Suhail ibn Amr uh, al Amiri. Okay, so let me just quickly read through this, um, and you know pretty much what I mentioned. So Suhail ibn Amr al Amiri was the chief of Amr and a long-standing enemy of the Prophet ﷺ. The Meccans sent him to negotiate the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And this is, this is another way to remember him. You know, those of you who have seen the film, um, The Message, so when they show the Sahaba trying to perform Umrah, but they're stopped at this place called Hudaybiyah, and the Qurayshites, the Qurayshis, or the Qurayshi elites, they send Suhail ibn Amr. Okay, Suhail ibn Amr, he is sent to strike a treaty um, with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to return and to come back the following year and there were other restrictions in there which we'll mention now so and he insisted on striking out Muhammad the Messenger of Allah on the document and replacing it with Muhammad the son of Abdullah after the conquest of Makkah so you know fast forward uh, uh, approximately uh, uh, just under a decade he was one of the three men who did not enter Islam after Mecca was overtaken by the Sahaba, but was nonetheless granted tem temporary amnesty. Okay? He finally embraced Islam after the Prophet ﷺ gave him a generous portion of the spoils after the Battle of Hunayn. Uh, this battle takes place closer to the end of the life of Prophet ﷺ, and we will you know, um, delve into that battle once we uh, get to that stage in the uh, you know in the Medinan period, 
Abdullah ibn Suhail was forced to march out to Badr against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Abdullah ibn Suhail is the son of Suhail ibn Amr. So he was forced to march out uh, to Badr. So if you have a look on the, um, uh, if you have a look here on uh, in the diagram, you have Abdullah who is the son of Suhail. He actually accepted Islam. Okay, he had accepted Islam, and that was during the Meccan period. So here he is, he's being forced to march out. You know, when Prophet Sallallahu had migrated to Medina, the Battle of Badr is about to take place. He was forced to march against the Prophet Sallallahu However, he managed to escape to the other side. Okay, and then he went and joined the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Jandal ibn Suhail, so another son, was imprisoned by his father. And as soon as the... So can you see how... Suhail ibn Amr, he's trying his utmost best to try and keep his family under his, um, you know, authority. However, it's not working uh, in the case of especially his two sons. So um, Abu Jandal ibn Suhail was imprisoned by his father. And as soon as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed, he was paraded out in chains in front of the Muslims. Because one of the treaties were that you cannot take someone from Mecca to Medina. OK, uh, against their, you know, fa familial um, uh, wishes. So after the treaty was signed, they then brought Abu Jandal in chains in front of the Muslims to kind of, uh, you know, mock at the Muslims and to laugh and jeer at the Muslims. The Prophet, Sallallahu however, advised Abu Jandal to be patient. He just told him to, you know, to wait this through, to do sabr. However, he later escaped. And he arrived in Medina. Sahla and Umm Kulthum, both daughters of uh, Suhail ibn Amr, um, you know, they migrated to Abyssinia with their husbands and returned after the ban on Hashim was lifted. And we will talk about this ban in the in the next coming few weeks after our quiz, inshallah. Suhail's brother Hatib Salit and Sakran ibn Amr also migrated to Abyssinia and returned with the others. So a lot of his family members, and you can see why they would have migrated, because Suhail ibn Amr, you know, he was very violent towards Prophet ﷺ, very violent and harsh towards any Muslims. So therefore, his own family members, you know, there was, there, you know, what, you know, they had more than one reason to migrate to Abyssinia. Ultimately, uh, Sakran died shortly after returning to Mecca. So that's his brother, and the Prophet ﷺ thereafter. Marries Sakran's widow Sauda radiallahu anha a year after Khadija radiallahu anha's death. Okay, so although most of his family joins Islam, Suhail ibn Amr al Amri resists the Prophet resists the Prophet longer than anyone else in Mecca. So that's a, a fact to remember that Suhail ibn Amr al Amri is the most violent and most uh, opposing Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he does that the longest out of everyone else. In fact, he imprisons his son Abu Jandal for becoming a Muslim and later represents the Quraysh at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So remember, this may come in your quiz as well. Right, uh, Banu Amir, where are they situated geographically in Mecca? So just remember, there's the Kaaba and where is number eight? Just over here. So they are somewhat of the Quraysh of the outskirts. Okay, right, moving on. The Banu Abdul Shams. Now, here is an important clan. Okay, here is a very important clan of the Quraysh tribe. And they are second only to the Makhzum, who we discussed in detail last week. And we, you know, we spoke about Walid as a very important figure amongst the Makhzum clan. So now we're going to delve into the uh, Banu Abdul Shams. Okay, so if you want, if you need to remember two important clans, it's the Makhzum and Abdul Shams. Right, so second only to Makhzum, the clan of Abdul Shams enjoyed a seat of power in Mecca. Like Makhzum, it deeply opposes the Prophet's message. And we spoke about this on you know, many, many occasions, right? That the Banu Makhzum and Banu Abdul Shams, right? They are the most powerful and the most richest clans of the Quraysh tribe. And because they enjoy these positions, as a result of the trade and as, as a result of the wealth that they have in their possession, they do not want to lose that. Okay, 
Therefore, they want the status quo. They don't want any change. So they are resisting change in general. And specifically, the change and the reform that Prophet Sallallahu or revolution that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is bringing to Mecca. Right? And another reason added to that is a lot of the verses that we've looked at in quite a bit of detail, and you can look back at our session on uh, the early verses or early surahs of Mecca. If you look at that session, a lot of verses talk about wealth. They talk about the life hereafter, and they talk about the accumulation of wealth, that how much of this will benefit you in the hereafter. Get your priorities right. That's the overall message that Banu Abdul Shams and Makhzum cannot easily digest. And therefore, they are at odds with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his message and anyone that supports Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his message or ultimately the Quran. Okay. So in addition to Utba and Shaiba ibn Rabi'ah, Abu Sufyan and his wife Hind remain staunch opponents. So this is where Abdul Shams comes in. Abdul Shams. So remember this name. Um, they are dismayed when several of their children join the Prophet's cause, including um Habiba radiallahu anha, who follows her husband Ubaidullah ibn Jahash. Ubaidullah's father Jahash ibn Rabi uh, is, is a confederate of Abdul Shams and all four of his children, all the Jahash siblings that we've looked at previously before, embrace Islam during the Meccan period. Okay, so now Abdul Shams, right? And I'm just, yeah, I'm going to look at this in a second. So if you look at the Abdul Shams uh, clan of Quraysh, where do they fit in, in the broader kind of uh, branching structure? So that's why I bought this here. So if you look at the image that I brought up before as well, that um, here is Abdul Shams. Now these four are all obviously siblings, they're all brothers, right? Abdul Shams, Hashim, Muttalib and Nofu, they are all brothers. So this is where Abdul Shams kind of branches out and Prophet Sallallahu is born amongst the Hashim clan and Abdul Shams, you can say, you know, the most powerful, the second most powerful clan of the Quraysh tribe, uh, you know, is, is, is from the brother of Hashim, which is the clan of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is how it looks like. So when it comes to Abdul Shams, they have two main kind of sub clans, you can say, the Rabi'a and Umayya. Now, just to mention Umayya, he's kind of the founder of the sub clan. And it's from him as well, you can say, that uh, the Umayyad uh, dynasty gets its name. It's from the from Umayya that the Umayyad dynasty gets its name. And how do we get to the Umayyad dynasty? So if you have a look, um, Umayyah has two sons, right? You have Abu al-As and you have Harb. He has two sons. Now, from his son Abu al-As, we have ultimately Uthman radiallahu anhu, who's also from the Umayyah sub-clan of the Abdul Shams clan. His other son Harb, amongst the Harb, you have um, Abu Sufyan, right? But also another famous individual, and that is Um Jamil. And again, we've spoken about her as well, who used to be the wife, uh, who was the wife of Abu Lahab. She's also mentioned in the Quran, in Surah, uh, you know, in Tabbachada Abi Lahab in Watab, right? And she, even she has been, her punishment has been ordained in that Surah as well. And she was the very same person after hearing about Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's proclamation uh, upon Mount Safa and his recitation of Surah Lahab. Right? She goes out to search for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she goes to Abu Bakr Radiallahu's shop, which is on the road uh, that leads to Mecca through the Mas'a, through the Safa Marwa area. And then she begins to ask Abu Bakr Radiallahu, where is Muhammad? Where is Muhammad? Whereas Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is just sitting right next to Abu Bakr, but she's unable to see him. Right? Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is one of the miracles of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Umm Jamil who was you know flabbergasted who was you know you know fired up and angry at the prophet and she wanted to say shameful things to her allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from even verbal abuse at that time and shielded prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from the eyesight of um Jimmy. so she could not see 
our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so as you can see, she's also uh, the sibling or sister of Abu Sufyan. And if you have a look, um, when it comes to Abu Sufyan, he's married to Hind. And from one of the other wives, so not from Hind, but another wife, I think it was Safiya, that Umm Habiba uh, becomes a Muslim. And again, when their children begin to accept Islam, that increases their enmity and their hatred towards Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can see this kind of building up in terms of uh, clan loyalty. So if you have a father, so you've got to understand the complexities at that time, right, and personalities. You have a father today, for instance, right, and if someone amongst the uh, the children does not listen and goes against their wishes and, you know, does their own thing, a father or a mother, um, you know, they, they are offended by it, they feel sad, and they, they are saddened by it. Now, take that back 1,400 years, right, into the environment of Mecca, and amongst this whole clan structure, okay, and add to that the ingredient of clan loyalty, chivalry, you know, all of these things. Um, and then you have one of your daughters, your own daughters, who leaves your faith, leaves the faith of your forefathers, leaves your, you know, kind of cultural norms, and goes and accepts this faith that just started a few years ago. So can you just imagine the anger, right? And, and, and the fire that's burning within Abu Sufyan to do something about this. And this is this is what kind of increases not only Abu Sufyan's enmity, but also Suhail ibn Amr and you know many other of the opponents of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Okay. Right, let's let's move on. So Abdul Shams, so quick quick summary. Abdul Shams was a brother of Hashim, as we've discovered. His son Umayyah was the namesake of the Umayyad dynasty. So now you know where the Umayyad dynasty kind of gets its name and where they trace their lineage back to. So they take it back to the Umayyad sub-clan of the... Uh, so the so if you go back here, so can you see the Umayyad sub-clan from Abdul Shams right here, who is the actual founder of the main clan. All right, so keep kind of visualize that, okay? Right, so uh, the Umayyad dynasty that wrested control of the Islamic empire in 661 common era, although Shayba and Utba were enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when both were va vacationing in Ta'if, they saw the Prophet and sent their servant at Das with grapes for him. So this is an interesting little anecdote that, you know, even though they were, you know, enemies um, of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And where do Shayba and Utba um, come into uh, the fork? If you can see, um, Abdul Shams is the main clan founder, Umayyah's uh, sub clan on one side of Rabi'ah on the other. Shayba and Utba are siblings under Rabi'ah, and both of them, when they see Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whilst they're on holiday in Ta'if, they send some grapes to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, an uh, interesting anecdote. Both were killed, however, in the Battle of Badr during their opening duels okay so again um you know this they're quite famous for that shayba and Utba. abu hudayfa uh sorry uh, yeah abu hudayfa was one of the few muslims from abdul shams so there were very few muslims from abdul shams and we're talking about the early stage in mecca he married the daughter of suhail ibn amr the chief of amr and together they migrated to abyssinia during the years of the ban which we will talk about in the few coming weeks. Walid ibn Utba, okay, so the son of Utba, the son of Utba who was killed in battle of Badr, uh, continued to be an enemy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and was defeated by Ali at the opening duel at Badr as well. Okay, Hind was married to Abu Sufyan and we saw she's also part of Abdul Shams and she marries back into, um, uh, you know, into the um, Bani Abdul Shams and was a violent enemy of Islam for the first 20 years. She lost her brother, father, and uncle at Badr and sought violent retribution at Uhud. She finally entered Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Umm Habiba, right, remember the daughter of Abu Sufyan, entered Islam early on and migrated to Abyssinia with her husband, Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh. So can you, have you noticed a lot of the Jahsh family are continuously propping up in early stage of Mecca. She was later widowed and married the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now that's an interesting fact, right? That one of the daughters of Abu, Sufi, uh, of Abu Sufyan uh, called uh, Umm Habiba, she became the wife of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
can you just imagine the level of anger right that Abu Sufyan would have experienced knowing that her that his beloved daughter has left not only his clan not only his family but has now also married his arch enemy who happened to be prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay her brother muawiyah later established himself as the founder of the umayyad dynasty right harab ibn umayyah okay, the son of umayyah had given honorary clan membership to jahash ibn rabi'ah the, the husband of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's um, uh, aunt umayma Abu Sufyan was one of the Prophet's biggest enemies. He was married to Hind and led the Quraysh armies to the battles of Uhud and the Trench. He ultimately entered Islam with his wife after the conquest of Mecca. So both Abu Sufyan and Hind accept Islam after Mecca has been conquered by the Prophet. Nofal did not play a notable role in this era. Note there are four other men named Nofal in this book. Um Jamil was married to Abu Lahab from the clan of Hashim. So remember that, Um Jamil, she's the wife of Abu Lahab. Um, Abu Lahab was from the clan of Hashim, obviously, one of the uncles of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here we have Abdul Shams, uh, someone from Abdul Shams clan marrying into Hashim clan. She was openly hostile to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and rescinded the engagements of her two sons to Ruqayya and Um Kulthum, which we spoke about in detail. So they had two sons who were in marriage to who were give, who had given their or pr promised their hands to Ruqayya and Um Kulthum and you know that all ended unfortunately Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu anhu was the great grandson of Umayyah he was one of the prophet's closest companions and later became the third caliph or khalifa in Islam and we will inshallah be talking about him in the future uh, in the seerah so Umm Habiba is an interesting individual to remember from Banu Abd shams So Umm Habiba and Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, they obviously married and they migrated to Abyssinia. When Ubaidullah passes away, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will ask the Negus or uh, Ashama, as his name has been recorded, but also Najashi, to officiate his marriage to Umm Habiba as his ninth wife. Okay, right now we move on. So, in terms of Banu Abdul Shams, to have an idea of where they exist and their power. So, if you look at number four, uh, so there is number four right next to the Kaaba. So, again, they are Quraysh of the Hollow. So, they are closer to the Kaaba itself, but also they have vast regions that they occupy beyond that as well. Okay, so these are the, one of the most important clans alongside Makhzum is the clan of Banu Abd shams or Banu Abd shams Right, let's move on now, and we are coming to a close. So today's lesson, inshallah, won't be uh, we won't be going over time. So Adi's position among the Quraysh had been in decline in the last few years. Historically, they were confederates like the Makhzum, but they had been drifting towards the scented ones, okay, towards the Mutayyabun, just as their bitter enemy Abd shams was moving in the opposite direction. Okay, so Abdul Shams is moving more further away from the, um, uh, you know, the, the ones closer to the Kaaba. Uh, and um, however, Banu Adi they're moving in the opposite direction. So they are coming closer um, to the um, ones around the Kaaba. So Nuaym ibn Abdullah is one of Adi's most prominent leaders. Nuaym ibn Abdullah is one of the Adi's most prominent leaders. Prior to him becoming a Muslim, at the end of the early Meccan period, uh, sorry, prior to Umar al-Khattab becoming Muslim, he shared his father's staunch loyalty to the pagan traditions of their forefathers and was outraged that most of his close family had just forsaken idolatry. So remember, you have his sister, Fatima, and her husband, both of whom who had, ex who had accepted Islam in the early stage of the Meccan period. And they were kind of the reason as well for the conversion or for Umar radiallahu anhu accepting Islam later on as well, which we're inshallah going to come across in the next couple of weeks. So Umar radiallahu anhu, the famous, you know, Umar radiallahu anhu, the second Khalifa who becomes, uh, you know, after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was from the Banu Adi tribe. So the Banu Adi tribe. Um, 
so in terms of uh, Adi and their relation to Juma, we will be looking at uh, when it comes to Adi uh, from the Adi at that time in Mecca, Nufail is like the head of the tribe. He has two wives, okay, um, and from uh, Nufail you have Umar radiAllahu anhu, who is uh, you know who is born. He has a sibling of Fatima uh, radiAllahu anha. Okay, Umar radiAllahu anhu he marries Zainab. As a result of that, Hafsa radiAllahu you know he has some sons Abdullah ibn Umar radiAllahu anhu who who is very very famous when it comes to hadith. So we hear many a times the name of Abdullah ibn Umar radiAllahu anhu coming up. So he uh, you know he is the son of Umar radiAllahu anhu. But also you have Hafsa bint. Uh, Umar radiallahu anh as well who is the daughter of Umar and as we'll learn later on she accepts Islam uh, sorry she becomes the wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the passing of her husband okay right um, and also here if, if you know just noticing um, when it comes to Umar radiallahu anh, his father Khattab marries the wife um, uh, uh, sorry marries the Sister of Abu Jahl. He, so Khattab marries the sister of Abu Jahl, and as a result of this marriage, Umar radiallahu anhu is also born. Okay, and right, let's move on. So Nufail had two sons, as you could see, Amr and Khattab. So let's let's go back. Nufail has two sons, Amr and Khattab, by two separate wives. After Nufail's death, his second wife married her stepson, Amr ibn Nufail, their child, Zaid. Now, this is an interesting anecdote, um, which is, you know, good to mention at this time. Um, so, Shazia, so Zahra, the quiz is going to be this and the previous session. So, just about the plans. Because there's a lot to remember, we thought we'll make it a bit fun by doing a quiz on the plans. So, it's on the 14 clans. It's not going to be very difficult. I'll keep it simple. Just try and remember some, at least one important point about each clan. Okay. So interesting point. So this may come up in the in the quiz. Zaid ibn Amr, okay, could not bring himself to follow his pagan ancestors and became a Hanif. Right. So remember, we spoke about the various religions that were there in Mecca and around Mecca at the time. And one of them, you could, I mean, if we can call it a religion. Uh, is another matter, but Hanifs were those who kind of, you know, you know, let go of idolatry, and they, you know, they had some kind of affiliation to the belief in one God. So you have Zayd ibn Amr. Okay, he leaves idolatry, becomes a Hanif. Amr's half brother Khattab ibn Nufail, who is the father of um, Umar radiAllahu anhu, was married to Abu Jahl's sister. He was a staunch pagan who chased Zayd out of Mecca. So can you imagine? Umar radiallahu anhu, whose father, Khattab ibn Nufail, chases out Zayd from Mecca because he had uh, left idolatry and become a Hanif. Zayd later died in Syria and was praised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in later years. Zayd's son, Sa'id Sa ibn Zayd, married Fatima bint Khattab. Now this is interesting. Marries Fatima bint Fatima, the daughter of Khattab. So the one who threw out Zayd, right? Zayd's son, Sayyid ibn Zayd, later on marries his daughter. When the call to Islam reached Sayyid, he and his wife became one of the earliest couples to embrace the new religion. SubhanAllah. So you can kind of see that the sacrifice and struggle of Zayd, right, did not go a waste because his son uh, and obviously his daughter-in-law later accept Islam. Right, so Islam continues in his lineage in a sense. Though they tried to hide their Islam from Fatima's violent brother Umar, they ultimately played a significant role in his conversion to Islam. Okay, so that's um, uh, uh, that's an interesting point here. Okay, so Umar the Allah was also surrounded by monotheists, uh, so people who believe in one Allah through his wife Zainab, her brother Uthman ibn. Uh, Mazarun was an ardent supporter of the Prophet. He was an ascetic by nature, and the Prophet had to guide him toward moderation. So he used to do lots and lots of sacrifices. He used to worship a lot. He used to, you know, try and be as close as possible to Allah all the time. And Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had therefore, you know, he kind of made him, you know, 
you know, showed him the path to moderation, that we don't need to go into extreme when it comes to religion. We need to adopt the path of moderation. We need to do things in moderation. So many years later, Umar who was surprised to see the Prophet weep at Uthman's funeral. So we're not talking about Uthman ibn uh, Affan, we're talking about Uthman ibn Maz'un, okay, who was Zainab's brother and who was very ascetic in nature. Umar later therefore changed his stance when he witnessed the Prophet and Abu Bakr also die of natural causes. Uthman Allah's wife, Khawla, was very close to the Prophet and later suggested Soda and Aisha radiallahu as suitable wives for him. Several several years later, Hafsa bin to Umar, right, obviously the daughter of Umar radiallahu anhu, married the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina. Okay, so here's a lot from the clan of Adi um, and um, you know their connection in terms of the seerah. So one year from now. Nu'aym ibn Abdullah will prevent Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu from trying to kill the Prophet by telling him to first confront his sister who had recently embraced Islam. And we will look at this um, inshallah in the next couple of weeks after the quiz. We will look closely at the conversion of Umar radiallahu anhu and the impact that has overall uh, in Mecca amongst the clans and amongst the even the elites and the leadership of Quraysh. So in terms of the Banu Adi, where are they situated? So if you have a look, the Banu Adi, they are Quraysh of the outskirts. Okay, So here they are. Um, they are further away from the Kaaba, uh, as you can see. Okay, And this is where Umar who used to live as well in this region. So he would come from there all the way down to the Kaaba. Okay, let's move on. We've almost uh, finished now. So the Banu Juma, the clan of Juma is not as powerful as Makhzum, Abdul Shams or Saham, yet is more influential than many of the other clans. Despite the early conversion of Uthman ibn Muzarun, Banu Juma contains a number of the Prophet's fiercest enemies. Okay. Now, remember when you say Banu Juma, when we mention uh, the clan of Juma, remember their chief, Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So Banu Juma, when you think of Banu Juma, you think of Umayya ibn Khalf. Now, why is Umayya ibn Khalf so famous here? Because he is the one who endlessly tortures his Abyssinian slaves. And one that we all are aware of is Bilal radiallahu anhu. So the one who tortures Bilal radiallahu an is Umayya ibn Khalf from the Banu Juma. Okay. And he was torturing Bilal radiallahu anhu, as we know, because Bilal radiallahu anhu refused even to utter on his lips any words against Islam or against monotheism, against the oneness of Allah. Surah Al-Humaza especially warns Umayyah for his jahil, uh, irascible um, behavior. Uh, a warning to every slanderer and backbiter who hoards his money in preparation. Is he hoping to buy immortality? No way he'll be thrown into the pressure. So here again, there's a warning against the character of Umayyah ibn Khalf here, but also the, uh, the, 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 the concept again of hoarding money and making money their ilah or God in a sense and thinking that money will not only last forever, but would it be able to buy them or immortality? So the Quran is reminding uh, specifically Umayyah of his jahil behavior or jahiliya behavior. Right, so what is jahiliya? And you know, we've looked at this before, but from this context here, the chief vice, okay, the central vice or central evil, you can say, or problem of the kuffar, of the kafirun, was jahiliya. Its primary meaning, according to Karen Armstrong, is irascibility. An acute, now what is that? What does that mean? It's an acute sensitivity to honor. Okay, so you know when you think of your honor, but you take it to another extreme. And not only honor, but your prestige and how people view you and how they look up to you. Right, so this becomes an illness in a sense. And also their arrogance, that's part of jahiliya. Okay, excess and above all, a chronic tendency to violence and retaliation to always be violent, and especially when retaliating. So this concept of violence 
in retaliation all of this okay all of this um is uh that's right all of this is that okay right moving on so i'm just just checking youtube for some questions um is this just repeating the standard muslim narrative or based on history and facts so um the depends on how do you define standard muslim narrative what do you mean by that you know when you say um standard muslim narrative what are you referring to uh, because uh, you may understand standard muslim narrative to be one thing whereas we, we see it to be another thing but where do we get these um ideas from or about these specific clans so obviously we're, we have to go back to and this takes us back to one of the earlier sessions that we've had or the earliest sessions that we've had on uh, the early biographers of Prophet Sallallahu life so the early uh, Sira writers um, and so we take a lot about these clans from them and you know you can also learn a lot about this from for example Muhammad at Mecca the book over here I have in my hand by um, Montgomery Watt he has a whole section. I think he's probably done uh, quite, you know, he's, he's really, really um, uh, laid out every single clan. So if you do want to learn more about um, uh, the, um, the the clans, uh, Muhammad at Mecca by Montgomery Watt. What I will also do is maybe scan just these couple of pages just about the clans and place them on these powerpoints as well so you can have a look at that as well inshallah so yeah so yes so when you're saying standard muslim let me know what you re you're referring to that uh, what are you talking about uh, but yeah it is fact it is from historical documentation it's not made up so but do do, do clarify what you mean by um, standard muslim narrative okay moving back moving on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu lives among the Juma clan. So he's from the Juma clan. He lives, uh, so sorry, he lives amongst the Juma clan and is alarmed when he hears that Umayyah would place heated boulders on Bilal radiallahu anhu's chest. Okay. He promptly buys the Abyssinians freedom and subsequently frees countless other servants, including uh, Amr ibn Fuhira and a slave girl who was abused by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu earlier. Right. Okay, so uh, so your name is Stop spam Spamming. So you're saying stories without historical substance. The fairy tales about the Makkah as described in the Sunnah, not reality. So again... Um, to respond to that, uh, it, it 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 your your question depend depends on your world view, okay? So it depends on your world view of what you understand to be the sunnah, right? What it means, um, what's your take on the sunnah? Are you looking at it from a um, uh, orientalist perspective? Are you looking at it from uh, a pheno are you taking a phenomenological approach to it? Because obviously, one can one can call than fairy tales however however it depends on one's worldview and their understanding of hadith and how we approach hadith okay um okay so what i'll do um is at the end we'll have a quick discussion on that i just want to keep in line with the clans and i will come back to you right at the end okay we'll, we'll be finished in the next five minutes so if you just stay online and we will have a discussion on this point so um moving on Okay, that's fine. Don't worry about the typos. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to quickly run through this and then we'll come back to uh, stop spamming um, uh, questions. Umayyah's brother, Ubay, is no less arrogant and ridicules the Prophet by crumbling a dry bone and blowing the dust in his face, saying, Claimest thou, Muhammad, that God can bring this to life? So we have Ubay, who's the brother of Umayyah. Umay and you know that famous incident where he sees um, um, a bone on the floor and he kind of picks it up and he crunches it. Okay, And he crunches it to such an extent that it becomes dust. And it's at that point that he asks Prophet wasallam that, look, this has become dust. Can your God bring this back to life? And it's upon that that Prophet ﷺ responds and this verse is revealed where Prophet ﷺ says, even so, that do I claim he will raise it and thee too when thou art as that now is, then he 
then will he enter thee into the fire? So Prophet ultimately, in simple English, he said that yes, yes, right? Allah has the power and he will raise this back to life again. Okay. And this is what Prophet says and responds. And then we have Surah Yasin and you know the famous verse, which I'll quickly read through now, because we have ultimately started running out of time again. Doesn't the human being see that we created him from a drop? Yet he's clearly defiant. He sets up depictions of us, all the while forgetting his own creation. He asks, who can bring old rotted bones back to life? Say to him, the one who gave them life the first time will give them life again, for he knows about every type of creation. He's the, he is the one who can produce a fire from green trees when you kindle it. Doesn't the one who created the heavens and the earth have the power to create something like a human being again? Definitely, he's the creator and the knowing. So the ultimate kind of the summary of that is, look, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's far easier, okay? If we can ascribe such a word, it's far easier for Allah to create something, for, to, to recreate or bring back to life from a substance that's already there, okay? Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything we see around us when there was none of it. And Allah said, kun fayakun. Allah said, be, and it was. So for Allah, it's far easier to bring this, you know, this, this crumbled up bone particles back to life, right? It's far easier to do that because Allah has done greater than that. And because Allah created that bone and the skies and the heavens and everything else around us when nothing was in existence. Okay. Right. And over here, Umayyah ibn Khalf, again, the overweight of chief of Juma. So remember, when you think of Banu Juma, think of Umayyah ibn Khalf. He will try to avoid, sorry, he will try to avoid marching to Badr, but is eventually goaded by um, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt into fighting at the end of the battle. Bilal, radiallahu anhu, who will find him injured on the battlefield and finish him. Bilal is best known as the Mu'azzin, announcer of the prayer during the Prophet's lifetime. After the conquest of Mecca, he climbs on top of the Kaaba to announce the call to prayer. Okay. Abu Bakr anhu, employs Amr ibn Fuhaira as a shepherd. Several years later, Amr will use his flocks to cover the Prophet and Abu Bakr anhu's tracks as they escape Mecca under the cover of night. So remember, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Abu Bakr anhu, you know, they, they go towards uh, Medina, they, they perform the hijrah, and as they are going to cover their tracks, he takes his flock of sheep uh, to kind of merge with their tracks so you know you can't the 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 Qurashites couldn't really tell which direction they went into after uhud the prophet will send amr with a delegation of 40 men to teach islam to the hawazin clan of amr along the way the party is ambushed and massacred when amr's body is not found among the dead the prophet later confirms that amr had been lifted up to heaven Okay, and we come to an end. So where are Banu Juma? Again, Banu Juma is also from the Quraysh of the outskirts. Okay, and uh, this is the geographical location. Uh, just for information, again, those who have not seen some of our earlier sessions, uh, this geographical map has been studied historically as well. Uh, and it has been produced by someone called Bin Imad. And Bin Imad uh, is a famous name when it comes to uh, historical uh, sites and historical locations in Mecca, especially for now. I'm not sure whether the same for Medina, but Mecca definitely. So if you want to find out more about uh, the situation of clans, the geographical locations, who was amongst them, Bin Imad's book on this is fantastic as well. Okay. Right, and finally, the last three remaining clans, Abu Harith, Abd dar and Nofal, the three lesser clans of Quraysh did not play a considerable, considerable role in opposing or supporting the early Muslim community. Nofal was part of the scented ones, but had grown apart from Hashim ever since Abdul Muttalib took back control of Mecca from his uncle Nofal. And this is obviously, we know why. Abd dar is the leader of the Confederates and retained the rights to the keys to the Kaaba. They maintain a historical a historic rivalry with Hashim. So do you remember we spoke about even earlier today where there was a rivalry between Abd al-Dar and Hashim? War was about to break out. However, Abd al-Dar 
uh, the, the decision was made that Abdul Dar and his progeny will keep the keys to the Kaaba, whereas Hashim will be responsible for taking care of the pilgrims. Okay, so they maintain a historic rivalry with Hashim that goes back several generations. Two noteworthy personalities from these clans include Musa ibn Umayy radiallahu an, who's from the Abdul Dar, and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, who's from Harith. So these two are notable figures, Musa ibn Umayr radiallahu an. Okay, so do remember his name, inshallah, he will come up again, and Ubaidah ibn Jarrah as well. In the coming years, Musa ibn Umayr will play a pivotal role in the helping of the Prophet ﷺ prepare Medina for Hijrah. He will remain a loyal supporter until his death at the Battle of Uhud. And Abu Ubaidah al Jarrah is one of the earliest Muslim converts who will later fight at all the major battles and ride alongside the Prophet ﷺ at the conquest of Mecca. He is one of the ten companions who have been promised paradise so the ashara mubashara the 10 who have been promised paradise um whereabouts are they they are on the map here so let's look for the banu nofil okay so they are the Quraysh of the hollow uh, can you see that they have uh, some land around here so and here as well so they don't have kind of major geographical locations that they occupy uh, you know like the others like the makhzum like uh, abd shams like hashim etc Okay, or even like Bani Juma, who are becoming a major tribe, or even like um, the Bani Adi, right? Where Umar, who Umar radiallahu anhu is from. Uh, the Bani Abd dar number six, so they have a bit more land. Um, Bani Abd dar they are also Quraysh of the hollow as well. And last but not least, the Bani al Harith, uh, they are Quraysh of the outskirts. And you can see them in number 12 around here. Okay. Right, so we've come to an end of our session today. So next week, what's going to happen at 6 o'clock sharp, if everyone can come online on uh, YouTube, um, and we will start our Kahoot session. The way we'll work is we'll wait for the first five minutes for everyone to join, and then after that, uh, we'll do like a practice uh, 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 quiz. So we'll have like a short, maybe five, ten minute quiz just to get you used to Kahoot for those who are new to it. And then after that, we will have a proper Kahoot session with about 30 questions at least about the 14 clans. I might add in a few other Sira questions as well, but mostly just focus on the 14 clans. And inshallah, next week, uh, we will do that. Now, I'm um, just going to sort this out and then look at your questions. Right, so now I can inshallah look at some of the questions that are coming up. Um <clears throat> Right, uh, so stories without historical substance, the fairy tales about Mecca as described in the Sunnah, not reality, no facts and real, real. Okay, so I think, uh, first of all, um, uh, you know, stop spamming, that's that, that's your name. Um, so basically, uh, I think these are very simplistic terms, right? When you say facts or when you say uh, Ustad, what will we do in a couple of weeks' time? So we will be looking at um, also the conversion of Umar radiallahu anhu very soon. But I haven't fully decided exactly what we're going to focus on. Uh, yes, so in terms of timings, uh, we may have to change the times uh, at some point. But don't worry, I will um, I will be updating you. As if the timing changes, I will update you. So we will maybe move it further ahead. So we don't um, have to kind of, you know, be looking at the time constantly. Okay, so Jazakallah for that. So yeah, so when we do change time, I will let you know. Right, so um, stop spamming. So basically, um, fairy tales and stuff like that, you've got to, you know, that's why, you know, when it comes to hadith, I don't know how much you've maybe studied usul hadith, but there are, uh, you can say, um, you know, measuring devices to see whether some hadith, okay, so if you look at a hadith, the the uh, you know the usul uh, hadith scholars they have given us tools right and they themselves have mentioned and noted which hadith you know are had, uh, hadith hasan or sahih or which hadith are da'if or even fabricated so if you're saying fairy tales are fabricated yeah for in, in a sense we can uh, agree on that because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know he himself um, mentioned that Right. So Prophet said, 
if sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if someone lies about me knowingly right intentionally lies about uh, about me or something that i have said okay then he will he or she will make should make his place in the fire of hell so if you're if you're referring if, if you're saying that's fairy tale and that's the same thing in my mind then that's a point of convergence we can kind of um, agree on that that yes there there are some hadith which are fabrications and which are ulama and usul al-hadith scholars have clearly determined to be fabrication so yes we don't take our knowledge from them you know they have clearly we, we're not even allowed to say them okay we're just uh, allowed to mention them in the terms of them being um uh, uh fabrications so uh, i know the hadith and science behind them okay um Over this, okay, so just, just yeah, so I'm going to try and answer your question. So if anyone needs to leave at this point, you're more than welcome to do so. But I'll just be here for questions, inshallah. Okay, so stop sewing, Dari. I'll be back on you for a second. Um, so this picture, this one, this picture here, uh, if you have a look closely, right, it's very lifelike. It's coming out a bit as well. Okay, so this is basically uh, Sultan Mehmet uh, Fatih uh, after the conquest of Constantinople or Constantinia. That is kind of the scene as they enter Istanbul or as they enter, enter Constantinople. That's from there. Okay, hope uh, you've got the answer for that. Um, <clears throat> so in terms, so stop some. You've got science in inverted commas. I'd like to know why. Um, maybe you're not satisfied with the. Uh, uh, you know the way the hadith scholars of the past have laid out the structures on how to verify the uh, authentic uh, authentic hadith etc but um you know a, a very good book i would recommend is jonathan brown's book on hadith uh, so professor uh, dr jonathan brown he um, has written quite well he looks at uh, orientalist writings he looked at he looks at their criticisms of the science of hadith and he also gives his own opinion and uh, you know opens up the whole chapter of uh, usul al-hadith in english so i would definitely recommend that um the description of mecca in the sunnah and in reality differs uh okay uh, the geography and agricultural claims are very different okay so how how do you come to your conclusion that um what's being described in the sunnah uh, and when you say the sunnah, or how do you define the sunnah? Right? What is your definition of sunnah? Because remember, you may there there is uh, also an off chance of um, mistaking maybe uh, uh, historians who wrote later on about the the life of Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with sunnah itself, but also uh, looking at the sunnah. Um, you know, the sunnah could be defined as, um, okay, so sunnah it technically is defined as the actual, the, the, the statements of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the actions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or something that was done in the presence of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he remained uh, silent, so he didn't, so, so because the reason why the third one is also part of the sunnah is not, if something wrong is done in the presence of a prophet, they cannot remain silent. So therefore, something has been done in the presence of the Prophet and he remains silent. So that's broadly what we mean by sunnah. Um, so when you say, so what has been described in the sunnah that you think is uh, opposed to the geography um, and the agricultural claims of the historians? And how do we determine whether what the historians are saying is accurate to what we understand today as well? So that's that's my question to you. Uh, stop spamming. I'm not asking you, I'm not saying stop spamming or stop spamming here. What well, I'm just saying your name. Maybe you could have had a different name, which would have been uh, easier for us. Yep. So if anyone else has any questions, uh, please do let me know. And hopefully if I can answer it, I, I will try my best to do so.
Okay, um, right. So you're saying we get plants and fruit like grapes and olives that are impossible in the Hijaz. So I just want to know, I mean, what what that's what that has to do. Um, oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, that's cool. That thank you for explaining your name. Right. So um, so the thing is, uh, when you're talking about grapes and um, olives and all of that, what has that got to do in relation to the sira that we're looking at today? And for example, the clans, or is it? Are you referring to a previous lesson that we were referring to? So do let me know. So in terms of our Sira lessons, okay, we look at um, quite a few uh, of the Sira books, um, and a lot of it is taken from the textbook that we're looking at, which also uh, goes through a lot. So for instance, one of one of the reasons why I do look at um, Montgomery Watt is because he looks at the historical perspective as well, and he what, he, what one thing he does quite well is he's very good at kind of marrying together. The historical side of things and also the sunnah because he also looks back at uh, some of the earliest sources that wrote about the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay so i don't know so you you're right you know in terms of grapes and olives these are mentioned in the quran and the quran is not talking about uh, the grapes and olives of this world it's referring to the metaphysical grapes and olives so i'm, I'm failing to understand the connection of what you're saying to our sira lessons in itself yeah Okay, so uh, Muhammad Rudan is saying, what do you plan on doing after Sira, inshallah? So our Sira will run for a very long time. We might go into next year. So uh, we probably have quite a lot of lessons of, on Sira. Um, but then what we will do is we'll make a very more simplified versions of Sira. What I'm also thinking of doing is that um, to have a quiz for every Sira session. So you know the Sira sessions that we've done before? Uh, as a form of revision and going over it again to maybe do a brief summary of each one and after doing a brief summary of each one to have a quiz and the purpose of that is to you know keep us connected with the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as much as possible okay uh, they are mentioned in description of mecca uh, in the different um texts along with geological descriptions that rule out the historical and claimed Mecca, yeah. So stop swimming. Uh, just in terms of that, I will have to look into this. Uh, I don't just want to say something off the cuff of my head um, and, you know, get it wrong. So I would like to, if you, if you can send me some of these descriptions that you're talking about from the historical, um, uh, you know, sciences, I'll be very happy to definitely take that on board as well. Um, one interesting thing, just based on that, um, I was asked a question by my niece the other day about... Um, uh, mushrooms that Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, he used to like mushrooms. He used to eat mushrooms, and um, you know, they, and now what I was trying to explain to my niece, she's only like I think about eleven or twelve, that when when we hear the word mushroom, the first thing that comes to our mind is what we see in Tesco. Now I don't know where you're from. I mean, if you're from England or um, another country, but Tesco is like a, a supermarket um, uh, in, or one of the famous supermarkets here in, in England. Uh, so the first thing that comes to a person's mind is the mushrooms that they would see in packets. However, if you look back at some of the mushrooms that were grown in Arabia and being grown there now as well, there are over like 20 types of mushrooms. And um, so when the Prophet Sallallahu refers to mushrooms, we can't just take the first thing that comes to our mind in the context of where we are living today. We need to go back and we need to look at the historical context as well. And, and in that sense, I definitely um, agree with you. But do do please send me what you are referring to. And inshallah, maybe we can explore some of that later on as well. Uh, there is a question here from Tahir Mahmood. There, will there be any special session on Isra and Mi'raj? Yes, I Jazakallah for that. I was actually just thinking about that today. And this is a few, a few hours ago. In terms of Isra and Mi'raj, um, I may invite someone as well to talk about Isra and Mi'raj, to, to, to look into it in a, in a more deeper sense, because a lot of questions um, arise from this, a lot of questions, um, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you, know, conf you know, questions being confusing, especially for teenagers who, you know, this session is aimed at. So, yes, there will be a special session where we will just focus on 
Isra and Mi'raj and look at it from different perspectives. So we'll, we might even have two sessions on it where we'll have the session talking about this uh, Isra and Mi'raj from our sacred texts, okay, from the, 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 the Hadith and also the Quran. And then after that, we may have, an, uh, 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 um, we will also have a guest speaker possibly. So I'm looking into that, inshallah. So hold on to that, uh, Brother Tahir, inshallah, we will get back to that. Uh, sounds like a great idea. Barakallah. Um, stops. That's fine. Okay, that's okay. Um, Zahra saying, I think all the fruits were brought there during Hajj days as a result of Hazrat. Okay, that's that. Yeah, so yes, I, I like that approach, uh, Zahra. So just to let you know, stop spamming, that Zahra is uh, one of our younger students. She's like 11, 12. So she's trying to think, um, you know, in the historical way, how many fruits would have come. But Zahra, what you've also got to think about is the heat okay would it be possible to bring grapes um, from say syria all the way down to uh, mecca despite all the heat okay would that be a possibility uh, similar with olives as well. well olives is actually more practical because you can keep them in certain type of uh, liquid or oil but yeah i like i like your thinking about that and the second point where you've mentioned allah knows best absolutely this is where we kind of finish our point that allah knows best you know we can never know the exact reality of everything that only lies in the knowledge of allah okay any other questions or uh, finishing points so stop spamming if you'd like to uh, you know say anything else but do mention do send over anything that you'd like to me to read and have a look at i'll be very happy to go through that once i get the time as well um you can send it to um, I'll put my. Um, if you go on our website, okay, it's Fatima Elizabeth Frontistry. The email there is info at Fatima Elizabeth Frontistry.co.uk. If you send it there, I'll be very happy to read that. Okay, and then hopefully I'll find out your real name as well. Right, any other questions? If not, I will stop the session here. Um, stop spamming. Do let me know what you thought of our session as well, so that um, hopefully, if I need to improve, I can do that as well, inshallah. Okay, so there's no more questions. So, inshallah, from me, Subhanallah, who behemdi, Subhanakallah, who behemdik, Shadullah, Ila, Ila, and Astaghfirullah, who tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullahi, wa barakatuh. Inshallah, see you all next week for the quiz, same time, six o'clock. When our timings do change, I will let you know at least a week before. But next week, six o'clock, we'll wait for a few minutes. We'll do a short quiz at the beginning, and then we'll do the main quiz after that. That gives everyone a chance to uh, do that as well. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, uh, stop spamming your back. Uh, would you be interested in lecturing on our show? So at this stage, I don't know who you are. Um, stop spamming. I don't know what your show, show is about. If you just send me an email, um, that will be uh, easy for me. Let me just actually put down the email here so it's easy for you to... Um, uh, get that i am quite overwhelmed with work as well i, I teach during the uh, daytime at uh, um, a secondary school so i may not have the time but if we can arrange it for maybe months in advance depending on what it is if i'm excited by the topic then we can go ahead with it i'm just going to leave my um our, our addresses email i'm just finding it for you here so I've just put it up here. So if um, you want to use that email uh, to email me uh, the different questions or whatever, or the different texts that you have, and also anything else, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay. Um, I don't feel sorry for people working during the... Why, why is that, um, Stop Smiling? Why don't you feel sorry for them? I really want to know your answer for that, Stop Smiling. It'll be good to get to know who you are. Uh, but from for now, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.